Hello, Tara Brabazon here, and welcome to our weekly conversation with Professor Priscilla Dunkwest. And this week, we wanted to explore how to develop a research trajectory. We're both really conscious about the nature of work in higher education at the moment, and how do we help the colleagues that we work with now, but also help the people who will follow us through the teaching and the learning and those teaching and learning commitments, which are so important, how is research created? But further, how is a research trajectory built in a week or a month or a year or a decade? So let's talk about strategies and behaviours that can create a change in our lives and our universities. This is exciting. I'm so excited about this one, Priscilla. I know I say I'm excited every week, but this I am so invested in because we talk a lot about teaching and research and all the cliches, but how do you develop a research trajectory? And, you know, after the PhD, students get so exhausted after the PhD, it's so difficult to to go again. So you finish one project. Where do you start? How do you start again? often without the scaffolding and support of a supervisor. And I always remember a great Canadian mate of mine talking about doing an academic interview with an early career researcher. And you know, this horrific question emerged, which was, you know, what's your second book? The assumption that your first book is your PhD. And, you know, what's your second book? And that's how we're going to hire you. Tell us about your next book. But what does happen next? How does the second book happen? What advice would you offer to early career researchers who are so frequently exhausted? How would you help them build that research trajectory, platform or foundation? Mm, I, I think you're right. People are exhausted. I remember I felt a sense of loss when I finished my PhD. It was like my thing that I carried alongside me for years and years and years of my life. And then when it was finished, it was sort of, Like, now what? So I think there can be a period of time where you're sort of a bit stunned. What do I do now? And I think in some disciplines it's easier than others, but I know that people often will go, well, I want a postdoc now. And in some disciplines they're really hard to come across unless you're connected with your, you know, with academics who are applying for funding or, you know, it's very hit and miss. So I wouldn't rely on a postdoc personally. Um, and so I think that I, I think look at the funding landscape, look at what your, you know, contemporaries have done in their careers, look at who are the funders who fund research and then how might your research fit with that landscape and then maybe write a little narrative about yourself, um, about who you are, what you want to do, where your expertise is, you know, what skills do you have and then where do you want to go in the future? And then, of course, to whom does your matter? Does your research matter, right? Like, it's a so what question, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Um, so, you know, how can you make a difference in your research area and then what's your what are your hopes for the future? So all of those things, wrap it up into a little narrative, stick it up somewhere if you need a little reminder and, and have that as a kind of compass, but an evolving compass. So understand the funding landscape. I think that can help just set some, set some goals for yourself. I think the thing with the PhD that, that can happen is that it, it's an, it's a time in your life where you are led by your nose. You 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 are in a project mostly. Some people inherit the project, but you're mostly in a project that you have scoped out for yourself, and that very rarely happens in a in a research career, because you're at the mercy of funding bodies, and funding bodies like to categorise research in particular ways. So. Really thinking about, you know, the scope of your research expertise and how that might be stretched to fit into other areas. 
Does that make sense? Oh, look, it does. And, you know, in so many ways you've captured, you've almost got to have a mission statement. After your PhD, yes, you go, thanks very yes. much, it's been brilliant, without the corporate rubbish attached to mission statements. Yeah, exactly. But, but you know, yes. w- what are we doing here, girlfriend? And be clear on that. What are we doing? And as you said, type that three three sentences out, put it on a wall somewhere and think about it. And as you've rightly yes. said, start, do something, momentum. Don't be paralysed. Mm-hmm post the PhD. Crucial. I think that's phenomenal. Yeah. And and look, a, a group that worries me a lot, and I've had to work with them in my multiple manifestations as of you, is a wonderful, precious group in our academic community, which now have titles like teaching only, teaching focused, education focused. When we started Priscilla, mate, who knew that was a thing? Yeah, nah. yeah no. Yeah, no, yes. But what would you recommend to these colleagues who are given no time for research? The universities have often sort of discarded their research. They don't want them in the, you know, in their algorithm for research. But what would you say to this group? Because they've got no support. Should they just give up and no longer research? No. No, never give up. I mean, the, re, yes, there's, look, we know what definitions of research are and it's about creating new knowledge and innovations and bringing new insights. But I think, you, you know, teaching only pe- staff often in universities, particularly in Australia at the moment, have a little space in their workload for a scholarship of teaching and learning Beautiful. sort of, you know, area. And so use that um to publish about your own teaching to you know when you're a teacher if you're a good teacher you know the theories you know a th- the theoretical landscape that you're sort of playing in and so you understand the latest research about a particular issue you've developed expertise that that's exactly the same for researchers so don't i say reject the binary of the researcher versus the teacher let's smash apart that binary and and just say you know you're playing in the same field you look at a, a journal um, you know, I could be looking at a journal and I could encounter a, re- a, a paper about an empirical research project where, you know, data was gathered and analysed. And then I also could be looking at an ethnographic piece where somebody's critically reflecting on their own teaching experience and something that happens in the classroom or they might have developed a project looking at a particular way of teaching, a form of teaching. And so, actually, the binary is artificial to some extent, and it, and it often is, you know, very hierarchical too, right? So, research is seen as sort of better than teaching, um, and, and, and I just say reject that, and don't ever feel locked out of those systems of knowledge production and analysis, mm. because they're absolutely relevant to teaching, Absolutely. And they're absolutely relevant to what we describe in the UK, as you remember, learning-led research. We rarely hear that phrase in Australia, but it Mm. means a hell of a lot in other places around the world. And and also, Priscilla, I don't think I've got had an hour of research time since 2012. Um, That's a Mm. very, very long time ago. Now, we can all give up if the infrastructure, if the man isn't supporting us, or we could go, Mm. you know, I'm, I'm going to ignore the lack of infrastructural support. These people will not tell me what my career as an academic looks like and get on with it. Because as we often talk about, you know, you're one, every single person is one day away from being redundant. And so mm-hmm. you have to prepare while you're in one job, you've got to prepare for the next one. Mm, absolutely. And and take those moments. I'll give you an example. Mm. I, I taught recently with somebody who um, had some skills in... Um, play was a qualified play therapist and we ended up we were teaching together had a chat Um, a colleague from the states emailed me and said I'm putting together a book would you like to write a chapter I brought in that person we wrote something about play and the role of play in teaching right so that's a publication it's based on experience but it's also a collaboration so reach out to your colleagues for collaborations in those spaces i think that's wonderful and crucial and empowering too don't don't give up if anybody is listening to this and feeling really lost at the, the you know the infrastructure is not supporting them please don't give up you matter we believe in you and just get up and write us a thousand words and get up the following morning and write a thousand words 
And that therefore builds on the, the question I've just asked you, why it's so difficult to start or to build a research career without support, without an infrastructure. And therefore, what is the role of SOTL, the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, SOS, the Scholarship of Supervision? We had a wonderful session on nitros, posters, learning-led research. What's the role of all these areas in building that research career and research portfolio in difficult times? I think if we go back to what we were talking about, Mm. about the PhD, is that Mm. often when you do a PhD, you've learnt a particular way of thinking about research that might have bracketed off those possibilities, those other more creative possibilities of, um, you know, talking about knowledge acquisition, production, um, talking about teaching. Um, And so I think, the you know, recognising and looking outside of your experience in the PhD, so learning about the emerging areas of um, research presence and the creative ways that other fields are doing it. So look at the humanities if you're in the sciences, look at the social sciences, you know, look across to see what's happening. And, And as you said, there's different national trends, right, as well. So I think I think it's it's knowledge acquisition and that can happen through you know when you're in a university or in an institution there's a lot of training you know we all have to do a lot of training (laughs) Um, have a look and do something that you think I don't know anything about that but I'm going to do it anyway so be curious about that world Um, and you know you and I talked before about um, a term that emerged in a particular national context or a particular you know the the teaching only sort of positions that we've seen those rise throughout our careers and so there are going to be changes the landscape will change so you know you could be changing the landscape so you know you could be inventing a new area of um of, of research or, or, or a place to put research. And so, you know, really keep on top of those innovations and, and maybe being one of the innovators. And also, you and I know, you and I have both been in those terrible senior lecturer jobs when you're teaching every hour that God sends. You and I have both been in those roles. Mm-hmm. And we all know once a year, sometimes if you're lucky, three times a year, you produce a teaching object that is astounding that you've actually thrown a pebble in the rock of knowledge and you're way ahead. So what I would always say to people is when you've done that, write that up. Write Mm. up that innovation because that is learning-led research and it will pick up citations and it will move you forward in difficult times. And And also don't... And don't, sorry, and Go. don't necessarily, uh, this is kind of counterintuitive, but mm-hmm. I was just thinking about, you know, my textbook that I wrote when yes. I first, you know, early on in my career, and people said, don't write textbooks. Nobody cares about textbooks. You know, it's not it's not taken seriously. And it actually, you know, textbooks speak to expertise in teaching. Like, they're great. They're great um ways to express yourself in a way that's you know bigger than a journal article um in a way that sets out your particular way of teaching and it and it's a really important addition to the literature i think oh and look i first inverted commas met you years and years and years and years and years before i met you or heard your voice or saw saw a picture of you i read that book and i went wow because i i recognized at the time what an innovative voice what an interesting way to think about reflection in social work. And this was this was a decade before I met mm. you. And, you know, mm. how many people have said to us through our career, mate, books don't matter, books don't count, right? Yes. Now, I, yeah. I'm 21 yeah. books in, and I'll tell you something, books mm. matter a lot. Wherever you go around the world, they're doing an introduction for your talk. They start mm-hmm. with Tara Brabbers on 21 books, and yet thousands of people say they don't matter. Well, those people would be wrong. Last mm-hmm. question. Gee, we've got mm-hmm. stroppy today. This is good. <laughs> we've got stroppy today. My, my final question, though, is about nuts and bolts, tasks and time. Teaching occupies almost every available moment in our lives. And, of course, we have families. And my obsession, we have sinks to clean. Sinks, my sink always requires cleaning. You always need to do vacuuming. And I've always used the mantra that we should pay ourselves first. So I start with... 30 minutes of research every day before I do anything else. But that may not be possible 
for some colleagues. So what are your strategies to try and slot in research into an already full life? It, you know, half an hour might not be possible, but maybe there's 10 minutes a day you can put in there. I think, I think for me, and I'm learning this more and more mm. later on in my years, I think, is it's there is almost like a, a discourse. I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time. Once I finish the teaching, then I'll do the research. And I ha and as you said, when I was a senior lecturer, I remember that it just is relentless. Yeah. But actually, I, I would suggest looking at your diary. And I know people say this, but this is one of the techniques that I found really useful: yeah. is to block out half an hour a day, yeah. twenty minutes a day, fifteen minutes a day, or ten minutes a day to be thinking about planning, working on something and doing it a bite by bite, you know, yeah. over time. And you will, by the end of the year, have a paper or, you know, an idea or, um, you know, a book idea. There will be something that will come from that. And I think, it's what, I think what happens is if we become only focused on one thing, then that's the thing that we're going to do. And we... We create wow. with that discourse this idea that there's going to be a magic time when we have time that we can do the research. There is no magic time. There's, you know, there's, there's your diary or whatever system you use to manage your time during the day has to take into account a lot of the tasks that you're doing in an academic job and these are going to vary and this is just one extra thing or one thing that that you can put in to set aside that time. Um, some people are able to do a day a week, lucky them. Um, for me, I try to do it most days. Yes. Um, and like I said, it's, sometimes it's 10 minutes. Sometimes it's just thinking about it. You know, I remember when I, just going back, not mm. to bang on about the textbook, but I remember mm. yeah. I used to, I was teaching a lot in those days and I used to get a coffee every morning and I used to use that, queue, I'd be in the queue, in Coventry, yeah. about to buy a coffee, and I used to use that time. It sounds ridiculous, but I really, really did this. Used to use that time to think, what could I write in that chapter, and what could I, and to and to really just think, to think and plan. Um, and so that was a way of using time that wasn't in my diary, that didn't take up a lot of time. It was a time anyway um, that I had that I was doing. Um, and it felt creative. It felt like like I was doing something that I liked doing. Now, what you've captured... So follow your nose. What you've captured there is the importance of thinking time. Thinking time yeah, is yeah. crucial and, and connoted with an activity. So in a queue at the shops, in a queue getting coffee... You mm. could be vacuuming, put some headphones on and use that as yes. thinking time. Uh, but then yes. also have the writing time. And what I've learnt from what you've told us today is, you know, I focus on the half an hour. So I pay myself first way early in the morning. No one is there. Mm -hmm. Not even dogs are awake. And I do that. And then I don't have to worry the rest of the day. If stuff happens, it's great. Not a problem. But what you, the mm -hmm. gift you've given us today is, you know what? Write that paragraph. Come on. Mm -hmm. Eight mm -hmm. sentences. Have the, yep. have the document open, write a paragraph, and if you write a paragraph a day, you have an article at the end of a month. Yep, yep. That is amazing. Thank you for your time. You change my life every week. <laughs> Thank you, Tara.